Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. After the horrific crucifixion of her friend Jesus, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary came to the tomb. After the kind Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear, and after Pilate gave him permission to remove Jesus' body early on the first day of the week while it was still dark, Mary came to the tomb. After Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus by night, also came bringing mixture of myrrh and alloy, and after they had taken the body of Jesus and wrapped it in spices and linen cloth, Early, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary came to the tomb. <clears throat> there was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified. And in that garden, there was a new tomb, which no one had been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And after this, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. The narrator of the gospel according to John takes his time, allowing us to, as listeners to absorb the magnitude of what happened. And he makes space for us to hear what happens next. Just as with the crucifixion narrative that we heard last night, the narrator wants us to be there to be truly present in this story. Just as the narrator wanted us to enter the tomb with the body of Jesus, and his attentive friends at his death. So he wants us to take our, take our place inside this story of Jesus' resurrection. So early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, we went with Mary of Magdalene to the tomb. And when we got there, we saw that the stone had been removed. We stopped moving in the dark. We were not sure what we were seeing in the pre-dawn shadows, but, but it's gone. The stone is gone. It's been moved. Our minds raced to all the different things that might have happened. Did they put the stone over it in the first place? Sure, yes, they did. We saw it. Who moved it? How did they move it? Why did they move it? Was it a friend? Was it a foe? Are they hiding the body? Are they stealing the body? Are they going to add insult to injury? It could be anything. Anything except. Anything except what Jesus said it would be. Anything except resurrection. And now we find ourselves running. Running with Mary to Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. We run breathlessly back with them both, staggering towards the open tomb. We hesitate with Peter. We rush in with John. We see the body is gone and the linens lying there. And we note a strange detail. The cloth that was on Jesus' face has been moved, folded separately, and put away from the rest of the linens. So then we run home with Peter and John, wondering again what could have happened. Stolen. Surely his body was stolen. But why? Well, it could be anything. Anything except what Jesus said it would be. Anything except resurrection. As the disciples return to their homes, we go back with Mary. We're inconsolable in our grief, desperate to find Jesus' body so that he can finally just be left alone for goodness sake. We frantically look inside just one more time to be sure, and we see something. Well, someone, we aren't sure who or what, could be anything, could be anything except angels, of course. And we blurt out in our pain, they've taken him, and we don't know where. Anywhere, really anywhere, but where he said he would be. Anywhere but resurrected. And then turning around, we run into Jesus himself. And in our grief, in our incredulity, we mistake him for a gardener, irrationally asking if he has moved the body of Jesus. If so, could you just tell us where it is? 
So we can retrieve it, we can rebury it, we can care for it again, anything really, anything at all, anything but what he said it would be, anything but resurrection. And then Jesus calls us by name. Mary, he says. Then we see, not just anything, but something, the thing, the thing Jesus said it would be. We see resurrection. And now, once again, we're running breathlessly to tell the disciples, to tell them what we have seen. Not just anything, but the thing. We have seen the resurrection. Maybe the reason that the narrator of the Gospel according to John goes to such lengths to draw us into the story is because he wants us to embody it to become a part of it. He wants us first to experience all the things that are not resurrection. We witnessed all that led to the arrest, trial, conviction, condemnation, crucifixion, and death of Jesus. We see the world do its best, or its worst, to seal love, hope, and life into a stone-cold tomb. We started today by walking with Mary towards something that was dead. And we grieve, blame, and rage, and we fall into despair, stumbling through the dark toward a place that we had seen a stone close into total darkness. But by drawing us into all the things that are not resurrection, the narrator prepares us to finally meet the risen Christ. Even then we are prone to misunderstand. And when we encounter the redemptive love of Jesus in the real world, we discover that it is so different than all the other things that are not resurrection that we confuse it. We could confuse it for anything, anything really, anything at all, except what he said it would be, anything except resurrection. But then, a supposed gardener calls you by name. And we hear, we see, we experience life and love and resurrection. Now, over the great 50 days of Easter, we will be invited by more narrators to place ourselves into more stories about the disciples' experience of the risen Christ. And if we accept that invitation, we will join them as they begin to live like those who themselves have been raised from the dead. And we will begin to let go. Let go of all the things to which we cling, anything really, anything except what Jesus said it would be, anything but resurrection. And when we loosen our grip, on the tools of the tomb, we begin to experience life, true life, joy, life, love, power, courage. And as we see the tools of death and destruction lose their power, we see stones rolled away from tombs in our life, and we see lives spring forth. And as we do, then we begin to step out of an inherited tradition describing how the Spirit worked in the church so long ago, and we will find ourselves experiencing the power of resurrection in our lives now. For the work of Easter is not complete if we leave it as a dramatic story bound in the pages of Holy Writ. It is only Easter when we too are raised, when we too are given new life, when we too experience joy and life and love of the risen Christ in our lives. It is only Easter when we allow the grace of God to transform us into people who are alive in Christ Jesus. And when that happens, when we experience a resurrection in our lives, well, we find ourselves running breathlessly again 
to tell the parts of the world that are still clinging to the tools of the tomb. Christ is alive. Christ is alive. You are alive. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.